Anybody else? <laughs> well, it's my pleasure today to welcome and introduce Mr. Troy Wilson, the general manager of Don Carr's Kingsport Mill. Uh, Troy brings, has brought more than 35 years of paper mill experience into, his new ro into this role in Kingsport, and he's held field operation and managerial positions in five different mills. His experience in leading two Greenfield container board startups and major machine conversions made him the ideal candidate to lead the local mills transition. I'm not going to spend any time talking about his stops along the way. I'll let you do that, Troy. But he's certainly an excellent leader, known for his ability to develop people and drive successful teams. Uh, one example, in 2015, he was recognized by the entire paper industry management association as superintendent of the year we're truly blessed that kingsport was chosen for the site of don Carr's first 100 percent recycle packaging facility and also that mr wilson is part of our community so please join me in greeting mr troy wilson <laughs> Okay, give me a second to get calibrated here. Okay. Okay, yeah, I'll give you a little bit more background behind um, myself. Um, I actually grew up in Lynchburg, Virginia. Actually, I grew up in a town in Big Island, Virginia. No one ever knows where that town is, so when I say Lynchburg, it's 30 minutes from there. Um, I started in the business. Actually, it's a little older. I've got 40 this year. I came straight out of high school. I went straight into the paper industry, and this is what I've done my entire life. So, I never went to college, had the intent to. I was a fifth generation paper maker when I went into the paper business, and now past that, cousins and nieces and all that still work in the same paper mill that I grew up and I, I started in. So, it's been there for quite a while, but. I had a long career. I moved from there. I went out to Cedar Rapids, Iowa, and that's where I started up 100% recycle mills. I started up two machines there. And then from there, I went to Plymouth, North Carolina, ended up in Ashdown, Arkansas, went to Johnsonburg, Pennsylvania, and now I'm in Kingsport. So I've been um, in the business for quite a while. So, but um, this is my passion. This is what I love to do. So you may see me get passionate as we go through this conversation because we have a great story to tell here. When you look at the mill, it's been here since 1916. There's been a lot of machines that came before this conversion, and those machines were for a reason. They served their purpose. They made their product. They were shut down never to return again. The difference here is we shut K1 down, and we converted it to another product line to keep it alive. So hopefully we're here for another 100 years plus. So different story. We changed the, we changed the history here from what the past history was in the mill. Anybody in here work at the paper mill? No? No one in here worked? That's okay. the reason we need somebody from Don Carr. Okay. All right. That's a good punchline there. Yeah, that's good. So I'm going to show you a little video. But before I do that, um, one of these is a pointer, right? So I, I talked about this mill going back to 1916. Well, 1916 started right here, okay? And we built machines across the property. Number one was here, number two, number three, number four, number five and then came K1, which is right against the Food City parking lot. We used up all our acreage, right? So what are we doing now? We leapfrogged back over and we demoed everything that started here in 1916 all the way across here. And we made room for the new mill that we're gonna run here. So I'm gonna show you a video and it's in a time lapse and it'll show you this going away and then the new, new um, warehouse coming up, which Pat had a lot to do with that. He built that warehouse. Not sure how to get it started. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> now, to live in the city of Kingsport, you never knew this was going on, right? This was, you never knew that this destruction was taking place inside the, the compound of our campus here. So, and we did that intentionally. 
with sensitivities of the community. We have, a, we have a manufacturing site that's right in downtown Kingsport, and I'm sensitive to that. I want to make sure we maintain the pristine Kingsport, but yet we have a manufacturing mill that's been here for a long time to try to coexist with both. When we were hauling some of this off, we kept most of it. When we were bringing the dump trucks out of the site, the instructions were to inspect every dump truck before it leaves the property. If we drop as much as one spoonful on the, on the roads out here, you pull over, you stop, you sweep the roads up, and then you go again. We don't want to make any negative impacts to the community here. So you can see the warehouse is coming along here. This is a 150,000 square foot warehouse we put here. When it's full, it's about 18,000 tons of OCC. That's old corrugated containers that come in bale form that you've seen here. If we didn't bring in another truck when this is full, it would last eight days. So that gives you, the Im that gives you a kind of a feel of the impact that it has to the landfill that this product was headed to the landfill, it made a U-turn, it came into our facility here, and now we're gonna make another product out of it. And you can see that downtown Kingsport is right there. Okay, so a little bit about what we did here so let's just one part of it move on okay a little bit about the history um, the mill started in 1916 as Kingsport um, Pulp Corporation and then in 1927 is what most of us know that it be what became the mead right doesn't say me the mead there but we all know it's the mead right so and then as, you, we, as we go along through time and through the years, you'll see 1948, this probably doesn't mean anything to you, but I just wanted to recognize here that there were still con, uh, significant contributions from a um, spend in this community to put equipment in place and continue to move Kingsport or move the Mead in through the years. So number five pipe machine came along. 1995, um, Will Lamett purchased Mead, okay? And then, well, Lamont had this idea that we're going to modernize the uh, paper industry. We're going to build a new machine. In that process, Weyerhaeuser came along and bought Will Lamont while that was taking place. And in 2002, we put a brand new paper machine in. And that's what you see over here to the right. That's the brand new paper machine. That's 2002 machine. That machine looks like it just came out of the box yesterday. This mill took care of this facility. It's well maintained. The housekeeping was immaculate. It was a great asset. It was a great asset for Domtar to start the packaging division here in Kingsport. We had a lot of op options within Domtar to go, but they chose this mill site for many, many different reasons. But one of them is the cost of the asset. You don't get any better than what you see here. And then that's an old machine that you see there that was part of the, I don't even know what number that is. It was one through four, but it was an old paper machine. So you can see the differences over the years on what the machines look like. Then along came COVID, and along came the downturn in the market. And this mill made primarily copy paper. And uh, every I say this a lot, and I'm gonna show you a graph here. Every day we came to work, there was one less sheet of paper to be made because of the digital age. There's no one out there inventing anything that says, hey, let's invent something that uses more paper. Right, you know anybody doing that? They're not. They're finding ways to use less paper, the electronic age, the filing, all that, the triplicate, all that stuff we used to do, it's just fading away. So we have a choice, right? We either fade with it and eventually we die off and everybody goes home and we go find something else to do. But uh, in this case, we found another product to run. So in 2020, we made the announcement that we we're gonna take this machine from an uncoated free sheet, that's what it's called, to 100% recycle. And that's what the conversion's been about the last three years. 2023, I'll show you some pictures here. We were about four o'clock in the morning on um, January the 15th, we made the first product. And I told those guys, if they make the first product without me being here, I'm gonna be really mad when I come to work the next day. So they called me and woke me up about two in the morning and said, I think we're gonna make it. So <clears throat> we made it to the reel then. So and then what we call making it to the reel and uh, we started making our first product. Okay. So here's, here's, what I'm, here's what I'm talking about. In 2000, when we did that conversion and made this mill uh, uncoated free sheet, there was 14 million tons of copy paper on the market to be had for this machine to run. We only needed 350,000 tons out of that 20 million. 
as you can see over the years, the, the, that market has declined and declined and declined. Not because we didn't have a bad product or not because we didn't have a good machine or we weren't investing. There's no customers. So it declined and then you can see the sharp downturn. We were at six million ton demand in 20 years. But we never saw an uptick. We never saw anything that brought us in a direction that said, hey, look, we're, we're going in the right direction now. This will be here forever. Everything we saw it says it's not going to be here forever. Eventually, we're going to have to do something different. So when COVID hit, we were already down for market downtime. We were down because we didn't have any orders. And then COVID came right after that. And then we had been working on this project for a couple of years confidentially. And we saw then that this is the time to pull the trigger. If we're going to do it, now's the time to do it. That's when we made the announcement. And then we were off and running. So what we're going to do here, because we're a little bit different, is we don't have corrugators. We don't have converters, right? When we were uncoated free sheet, we had rich fields. We converted our paper. We took it over there and it converted. Remember the old years of the press building here? You made it on one side of the street and you brought it over here. We don't have any of those. We're not planning on building any converting sites. We're not planning on doing any of our own boxes, packaging at all. But we're going to work with the independents. The independent customer doesn't have that either. So we're going to be the independent's customer and and they're going whoops. We're going to be the independent's paper machine and they're going to be our customer. So it's 8 to 9 million tons of independent product out there to be had. We built this machine to do 600,000. So we only need 600,000 out of that 9 million tons. Okay, this is a great story here. Because of the business we're in now, we became much greener, right? Everything we touched became green. Here's some examples. It takes roughly 685,000 tons, 700,000 tons of OCC, the waste, to make a 600,000 tons a year in paper, okay? So you say, well, that's a lot of waste if you need 685 to make 600. But you gotta think about it this way. This is the part that was going to the landfill that now we're going to bring into our facility and we're going to make another brown box out of it. And it can be recycled over and over and over. So, fresh water usage. When we were uncoated free sheet, after we went through our wastewater treatment and we cleared the water to acceptable levels to discharge back to the river, we were putting 12 million gallons of water in the river every day. 12 million. Now we're at 3 million. We closed the water systems up we're recycling our water and we're continuing to close them up even further. So not only are we recycling this, we're recycling water. We're bringing water back. We're not letting it out. We're keeping it in the mill site. Good story. Fewer chemicals, no more chips. No more chemistry needed to break chips down. Nothing, no more chemistry to make pulp, to make the product we made before. All that chemistry is gone. There is very little chemistry in this sheet. Very little. Um, in fact, most of it is gone. So. And then as far as what we had, what we called a recovery boiler because of that liquor cycle and all this chemistry it took to make pulp, um, air emissions are better as well. We have two boilers there. We call number one and number two. One was a recovery then and one is a biomass boiler, which burned bark and waste. And we'll talk about that a little bit here too. The biomass boiler burnt bark back then and we did it for steam and we did it for, for energy. The largest byproduct of an OCC plant in the rejects that we can't use to make paper out of is plastics. There's 125 tons a day of plastics that come out of these OCC bales. Then in most recycle mills, they don't have the means of a biomass boiler to incinerate that. They send that off to the landfill. In our case, we're going to keep it, we're going to incinerate it, and we're going to turn it into energy as well. So another great story. Uh, electricity, we do have a turbine generator on site. We can generate 95% of the electricity we need right on site here. And then we went the electric clamp trucks um, as well. We didn't have any experience in that. We took a little gamble on that and they performed well as well. So we talked about tearing those old buildings down. Again, we're thinking anything we can do to turn our place green as we can be. We didn't, this is actually a larger number. This ended up at like 40,000 tons. That's the old buildings. That's the old buildings we tore down. And this is an awesome story as well. Those were the buildings that housed all the old paper machines that we tore down to make space for the new machine. All that blood, sweat, and tears from the community that worked here before us that they put into this mill, their life, 
We used that to crush all of that. We didn't send it to the landfill. We formed a base to the new warehouse we built. So in a way, they're the foundation to the new mill. So we saved that, that's under that warehouse. And you can see we have our trucks here. This is what OCC looks like here. You can see, see that in our warehouse. Here's bales being fed on a pulper, and what that actually is, you put these bales up, they go up, they go in, a pulper, and it's um, just like a blender. It starts the process of, of a slurry, breaking things down, and then the OCC plant takes out all the contaminants down to the point to where it's just clean fiber again to make, uh, make a box out of, or make the sheet that they make the box out of. Okay, so here's the first, first reel of paper we made. You see there's a bunch of proud guys standing right there. That's the team that made the paper that night that um, started it all here. So uh, we did change how we do work as well, line of progression. It is a union facility still, but we changed how we do work. We have a flow to work high performance team concept now, which means that when you learn a skill, we will pay you for that skill, you keep that money. You learn another skill, we pay you for that skill, you keep that money. And you can, you can do this three, four times you don't have to wait for someone to leave in order to learn the next job so you can get a raise. We don't, we're not waiting on that. We're going to train you in the jobs. We're going to give you the pay for that, and you're going to get those bumps in, the, in, in your raises a lot sooner than that. Here's the only trade-off. Now you got to do them all. That's all we ask. It's flow to work, right? You flow to where the work is. You flow to where the issues are. You have the knowledge. You work those skills that you were trained on. When we were the old mill, I call it, we were 340 employees. We're 170 now. This has ticked up a little bit because I've seen the need to add some more people. We're probably closer to 180 now. This is hourly and salary. And um, it's a much smaller workforce, but it's because of the nature of the business we're in. A lot of what I said went away, but when that went away, jobs went away as well. All that chemistry side of the process. So, So this is kind of how it works. I'll spend a whole lot of time on this as well, but um, they're, they're, you're broken down into families. And these are all the jobs that you see here and um, outlined by title. Um, uh, this number here reflects there's one person for this job, one person for that, and three people for that. It's three, four, five. That's five people. That's actually six people in that family. I put seven extra people on every team, more than you need to run the mill times four, that's 28. That's another 28 people in the mill. If everybody came to work today, I got 28 extras. That's for you to manage and run your own team. When I take a week's vacation, that doesn't mean that I put the burden on you to come fill for me on your off day because we don't have anybody else that knows how to do that job. When I take a week's vacation, the team handles it. The team has everything they need to do as far as a business unit that doesn't have a negative impact on any of the other teams. So leave of absence, you got enough people. You got seven extra people. Four people are on vacation. I still got three extra people. What are you going to do with those? I'm going to train. Okay, somebody called in sick. I'm still training. Okay, I need some housekeeping done. I'm still training and I'm using people to housekeep. You're your own business unit and you manage it that way. Everyone goes home at the end of the day and no one gets stuck. This is the DuPont schedule we're working as well. Here's what I hear all the time, and I'm trying to work with it because it isn't how I grew up. How I grew up is you go to work and you just go home when the work's done, right? You may eat lunch and you may not eat lunch. You may have to work seven days and 14 days in a row. You know, you get dirty, nasty, sweaty, that's just part of it. Employee retention and what's important to them. I've been told time and time again, I actually got told this weekend, Troy, it's not about the money, it's about the quality of life. I want to spend time at home. I want my off days. I don't want to work at night. I don't want to work at weekends. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do that. So we cr the DuPont schedule, I know Eastman works that. But if you marry this workflow with that system, with the schedule, then you create a quality of life that they've never had before. And that's important to me. I want to make sure the employees at the mill have the best quality of life that they can have. It'll generate tons at the mill just by having employees that are fresh, want to go to work, want to be there proud of what they what they have that'll generate the reliability in tons alone just in that then that type of concept so but anyway so it was important to do that and I just talked to this and I won't go through all this but this just talks about how we flow around and what kind of what the rules of engagement are when um, when we train you in skills but we do I will say this we have operators doing mechanical work 
We train them to do the basics. So if there's something simple that is within their knowledge and skill set, they don't call maintenance. They just do it. They lock it out, they do the mechanical work, they put it back together, they unlock it, and they start it back up. It's got to be within what they're trained and qualified on. Uh, they help maintenance when needed, and then maintenance helps operations when needed. It's not, when they brought everybody back and didn't want to hear this, that's not my job, it is your job, okay? And if I knew it was going to be like this, I wouldn't have came back, you know it's going to be like this, because I'm telling you now before you come back, okay? So it created an environment of a family environment that we work together to get the work done so we can all go home at the end of the day. And then the maintenance guys are multi-craft. I know you guys are familiar with that, but an electrical guy may be changing a coupling on a pump, and you may see a mechanical guy in the MCC room. We train them to be multi-craft so they can do both skills. This just represents some of the meals that we're looking at making conversions. You can see Kingsport's at the here, and you can see Ashdown, Arkansas is on that list, Hallsville, Kentucky, and Marlboro, South Carolina. So we're moving our business and growing it in a different way now. A little bit about the project. This is something we're very, very, very proud of. Most there's not a lot of people that ever walk this path. We went 2.5 million uh, hours without a lost time injury. 2.5 million. That's just uh, that's just unheard of that you can go that long. So, Dom Tars caring is one of our core values. You know, we we at times in there where we had safety incidents, we shut the whole project down. We shut everything down. And the burn rate in this is a lot of money not getting work done, but we saw safety as being the number one priority, and if we say it's the number one priority, we've got to act like it's the number one priority. The audio and the video have to align. So, very proud of that. Um, very challenging project. At one point in time, and I hear this from Chris a lot of times, we were 1,100 employees from contractor standpoint on site every day. And you probably saw it at Food City, you saw it everywhere. There was a lot of people around here, but 1,100 1, or so for probably three months we were at this staffing level. Um, 40 different contractors. Pandemic, of course, we had to deal with that. And then think about how we do a project like this through a pandemic when you got to wear a mask, you got to social distance. If someone gets COVID, you got to send them home for 14 days before they come back. So now you got to restat. We went through all that through COVID and yet still had a successful project. And we had two OSHA inspections while we were surprise inspections. Just showed up and said, hey, we want to see your site. You know, that um, makes you a little nervous, right? Because there's 1,100 people out there and I can't control those guys all the time. So we walk through the site and they don't, um, they uncover every rock that they can turn over to and uh, we pass both inspections. So that's, a, that's a, something to be said there too. And then in the right-hand corner, we had to build a bridge. You guys heard about building a bridge across Reedy Creek. This is part of it coming down the highway here, 175-foot beam they brought in and to build a bridge across Reedy Creek. And then here's um, the old Cloud Park area that we converted into uh, a truck area where they come in and they scale in. We use the old scale house there as well. And this was a joint venture between us and the city that worked out very well, I was telling. Mayor Shull, I said earlier, we started together and we end together because they were just recently in the mill and we were doing this big production video and asked those guys to come in and be a part of that. We started together and we kind of ended it together as well. So, good story. All right, COVID, talked about that. Um, supply chain issues, yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah, over 500 critical components were between 60 and 300 days late. And we're trying to build a machine on our timeline, keep it within budget, keep it safe and all that. And we got 60 and th we got 500 components that are 60 to 300 days late coming in. That's a year, right? The longest one. So what we did was we chartered our own ship from China. We got our own ship and said, if we get our own ship, will you put our stuff on that ship and bring it to us? And we were smart enough to do a break bulk vessel because if you saw the news where all the containers were sitting out in the ocean there and they were just waiting a month to get into a dock, this guy right here that was sailing this ship went right by them all waving at them. <laughs> you know, he's got his own cranes on there. You see those cranes over there? We flew down and uh, we actually tracked it from China um, all the way and we had a tracking system. We looked at it every day just to see where it was in the ocean to make sure it was still coming because we needed these parts. And uh, so we went down and met the guy, the, the captain of the ship. 
he'd been on the ocean for a long time and he just wanted to hug us, give us coffee. He wanted to feed us cookies. I mean, he was glad to see people, you know, so <laughs> he was, uh, it was, um, the name of the ship was Veronica. So I thought about naming the machine Veronica. This just some components that probably you don't aren't familiar with, uh, but here these are the conveyors that we put those bales on. They go up and go into two pulpers here. This is just part of the OCC equipment there that cleans all that. This is a new building that we built to house all that in. And this is a beautiful picture uh, here of the OCC warehouse at night in downtown Kingsport. And here's the new bridge. The trucks crossing it going into the into the mill site here. So this was a very important part, this bridge piece, to keep all this traffic out of downtown, to keep them coming down 26. They get in, they get out, they do their business. You don't even know they're here, right? If not, if we hadn't have done this, we would have people everywhere. These trucks would be everywhere. So we're trying to control that. And then this is just a picture of the machine. Um, you don't understand any of this, but um, the things in the green, this is the weights that we'll make, 18 to 42 pound, medium and liner, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. We put two press sections in, we put all these dryer cans, which are steel cans. This is what came from China. These dryer cans is part of, there's 50 of these cans, and they were in the bottom of this ship, and they just toothpicks. I mean, they're huge, they're pretty big. And then we put a new winder in. Here's some of the final product. Each one of these reels weighs 75 tons, and we'll run at least one reel an hour. And then here's just part of the machine that you see, your head box going in. That's all I have for you. Mm -hmm. So, um, we got time for questions. questions. Yeah. <clears throat>